We're going to continue in a series uh, that, that is a little bit tense because we're talking about politics and how we as Christians should respond in a politically charged world. Last week, we introduced this idea of, of citizenship. And, and we talked about that we as believers in Jesus, we actually have dual citizenship, but we do not have symmetrical dual citizenship. Right? A lot of times as Christians, we hear phrases like God and country. Here's my problem when we say God and country, is we elevate country to the level of God. It should be God then country. We have dual citizenship, and we are first and foremost citizens of heaven. We are citizens of the kingdom of God. We serve God's kingdom above all other kingdoms. We talked about the Apostle Paul and how the Apostle Paul also had, actually kind of triple citizenship because he was Jewish, he was Roman, and he was a follower of Jesus. He was part of the kingdom of God. And in the times that he was Roman, like he, he leaned into his Roman citizenship. He did his civic duty. In fact, when he got arrested, the thing that kind of caught him for being arrested was actually him going and doing his Jewish duty. He was actually going up to the temple to worship and pay his tithe to the temple. But before anything, he was a follower of Jesus. And we talked about how in this world we have dual citizenship. We should be good citizens. We should do our civic duty. We should render unto Caesars what is Caesars. These are the words of Jesus. And that by actually doing our civic duties, if we do it well and with hearts that are Christ-centered, we actually end up doing our, our godly duties as well and following Jesus. Because we render what is to Caesar what is Caesar's, but we give to God what is God's. And last time I checked, everything is his. So our citizenship, first and foremost, if we are a follower of, of Jesus, our citizenship is first and foremost to the kingdom of heaven. We talked about how we have ID cards as U.S. citizens. We have passports and we have driver's license and we have social security cards. You can get a passport card now just in case you want to go on a cruise and don't want to take your whole passport. That's literally the only reason to use it. Or Canada, thank you. You can go to Canada with it. So like I said, the cruise is the only reason you would want to use it. I'm just kidding. If you're from Canada, I'm sure it's a nice place. <laughs> well, I don't even know why I just threw shade at Canada. That was not nice. <laughs> But it happened, so there we go. Uh, I'm sure they're going to clip that sermon piece and put it on the internet for us all to see. Um, but we, we prove our, our heavenly citizenship differently. And, and these are the words of Jesus. He said, a new commandment that I give you, he's talking to his disciples, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. You know how many times Jesus told them to love one another in, that, in those two verses, in that new commandment? Three. You think it's important to love one another? Our ID cards as followers of Jesus, our ID cards as members of the kingdom of heaven is how we love one another. But when we talk about the political climate, we as believers, well, we as American believers live in often, love is not something we associate with politics and the culture of politics. In fact, I think I've probably said more often, man, I hate that guy than I've ever said. I love that guy when I'm talking about some politics or, or a politician. Or I go, man, that guy's an idiot. Does he know anything? A monkey could do a better job than he's doing right now. And even me, I catch myself. When I'm talking about the culture of politics, as a believer, I don't always show love. Sometimes I do the exact opposite. But if I'm following what Jesus said, we've got to learn how to love one another. And that is our ID card as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We live in a politically charged culture and regardless of which party you usually vote for, each party wants your vote and your total dedication, right? They don't just want, they spend billions of dollars courting you as a voter. Over the last Seven years, I have lived in three different states. 
And so that means anytime there's an election going on, I not only get the text messages from politicians in Colorado, both major politicians for most major races. So like Congress is one, the president is another, the other districts, the, the senators and representatives, are, I'm getting all the texts from Colorado. I'm also getting them from Georgia. And I'm also getting them from Texas. And so I've decided to do something about it because each one of them wants my vote. So I've just started, I've decided to start asking them questions to see if they deserve my vote. Things like, is it on your agenda to make sure the McDonald's ice cream machines stop breaking? <laughs> Sometimes people text back. And one politician I got to kind of agree. Yes, Lord. <laughs> one time I got a politician to agree that he would look into the issue. Actually, it wasn't the politician. It was the person working for the person working for the person working for the politician. But they're going to look into the issue. That is my go-to. Can you fix the McDonald's ice cream machine? Because I'll tell you what, the, the politician who figures that out <sighs> will solve all and every major crisis that we have as a nation. I believe it. We lived in a politically charged time. We live in a politically charged time. And we are followers of Jesus before any man, any party, any position, or any leaning. At least we should be. And, and hear me, we struggle with this. I struggle with this. But before we follow any news station, any political party, any even ideology or policy, we should follow Jesus. Right? You agree with me? Are we starting on the same foundation? Then how should we... How should we, as followers of Jesus, interact with people in politics we disagree with? How do we normally act with people we disagree with? Well, if we disagree with a coworker, sometimes we, we try to be nice about it. If we disagree with our aging parents, we rise and go, my gosh, I can't believe that they have that opinion. In 2013, I was serving as a youth pastor in a church near Austin, Texas. And a well-meaning church member asked to have a meeting with me. They were, they were pretty new to the church. They knew I was a youth pastor. And I remember he sat down with me and, and he told me about a video, a film, about an hour-long film that he had watched that had impacted him and changed his views on student ministry. And he really wanted to know what I thought. Now, he was kind-hearted, but I'll tell you, like, this video really impacted him. And, and what it did is it, it changed his idea that we should not have student ministry or even elementary or preschool ministries. And, I mean, I don't know, like, as a youth pastor, that's kind of my job. And it's also something I, I earnestly believe in. And, but I told him I'd watch it. And so I watched a, this hour-long film that used a fringe theological position and several pretty weak arguments to attempt to prove, to attempt to prove that the majority of the local church was in error about this. And as a pastor, there's a way I should have handled the situation. And there's a way that I should not have handled the situation. <laughs> Which do you think I chose? <laughs> I did not sleep the night I watched this film and stayed up all night and I wrote a 17 page response paper. I also would say like I'm, I was pretty fresh out of seminary and I, I knew so much then I'm so glad I don't know as much as I did right out of college. Anybody else with me on that one? And I, I, I'll say this man, he received the, my response well. I think he was overwhelmed. And we just didn't talk about it again. I don't know if he really read it. If I'm honest, I hope he didn't. It was filled with my arrogance and hubris. And here's the thing, I still think I'm right. And I th still think my positions are right, but how I went about having that conversation didn't help the situation. 
Sometimes people are wrong. Sometimes people who are wrong think they're right. That is why our nation is so divided. You have a faction over here on the left going, well, I'm right, and I wish those people over there could just see that they're wrong. And you have the people over here on the right going, well, I'm right, and I just wish those people over there could see they're wrong. How could they think that? How could anyone really believe that? And then we really start getting into, into dangerous territory where we go, well, they're just evil. And all of a sudden, our Christian ID card is put way deep down in our wallet, and we're not showing it to anybody. One of the major challenges is to face as citizens of heaven is how we respond to the person behind the disagreement. We can disagree with people on thought. We can disagree with policy. We can disagree on, on politics. We can disagree with another party. I mean, I, I don't think it's possible in, in our country right now to not disagree with, with one party. Sometimes you disagree with both parties. About a third of Americans disagree with both of them. But what happens when it stops being a, a, a person behind the screen? What happens when it stops being just a, a party or an ideology? What happens when it becomes an actual person that you interact with, that we interact with as believers? How should we respond? And I think this is actually one of the major flaws of social media. We read and receive content personally. Like someone says something on social media and we get really offended. Sometimes it's people we know or went to high school with and we think, I always knew that they were going to become a bad egg. But sometimes we, we get really offended. And then like, we're like, Com oh, oh, there, there we go. We back? See, I told you, right? The devil doesn't want us to have church today, guys. <laughs> He stole my truck. <laughs> Setup was a nightmare. The lights are weird today. But you know what? We're going to have church. Come on. We, we love going to the comment section on social media. How many times have I typed out a comment to argue with someone because I was offended by that, what they posted and then went, man, I'm a pastor. I better not post that. <laughs> and I deleted it. We read content personally, but we post and spread content impersonally. Yeah, I believe that. I'm just going to say it. We're not trying to offend anyone, but man, don't we get offended? I think it's the major flaw in social media is we can post stuff that's impersonal, but we read stuff as it's personal. And it's making it worse. Last week, we, we introduced four guys. Their names were Daniel, Mishael, Azariah, and I forgot the other one because we mostly know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And we talked about these four men who were, were part of the royal family in Israel. And Israel was captured by, or, or Jerusalem was sacked by the Babylonians. The, the country of Judah was actually sacked at this time. Israel fell. And, the, and, and these four guys, not just these four guys, but many of the, of the Jewish men and women were taken into captivity. They were taken into slavery in Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar is the king. And, and out of these, out of all the guys, they take these four guys and go, hey, you are part of the royal family, so you are going to be set aside. In fact, one of the things it says in 1 Daniel, 1 Daniel, in Daniel 1 chapter 5, is the king assigned them a daily portion of food. That the king ate, right? That's good food. It's very rich food. And of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king, right? This is a big deal. This doesn't happen to most people who, who are captured into captivity or into slavery. Like, they got captured from being royal in, in Jerusalem to, to being just royal in Babylon, and they're going to get this training and then stand before the king. The idea is that the king is going to use these, these, these men of, of royal stock from, from Judah, from, from that line of David, to be part of his kingdom also. But this part where he gives them his food is really interesting because it would be better, way better than anyone else in the kingdom ate. I mean, they're eating the best possible food. But a few verses later, 
It tells us in verse 8 that Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. So here's a problem that we all of a sudden have with Daniel and, and Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, is that they're given the opportunity to eat this rich royal food, but something about it causes them to hesitate and go, no, it's defiled. Now, there's lots of speculation about why. Some people think that the food and drink of the palace would, would likely have been part of the, the temple worship in the Babylonian kingdom, and they would not eat food sacrificed to those false gods because that food was defiled. Others think... There, there was observances and part of the Torah about which animals can be eaten and how they are to be killed. And they didn't think that the Babylonians killed the animals in a clean way and so they couldn't eat them. Meat and wine is often festival food and abstaining from it's a sign of mourning and penitence and would not be appropriate to eat that food if you were just taken into exile. Others suggest that abstention from meat and wine was an ascetic practice among various groups, including uh, the Essenes, and the, and, 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 which is, which is a, a, a sect, a kind of their own political party in ancient Jewish culture. Accepting the king's provisions could have indicated a dependence on him, entry into a covenant-style relationship with him, becoming his courtiers and accepting a commitment to supporting him as he supported them. Whatever the reason they said no, the important thing is that they said no because of their faith-based conscience. Something about their faith would not allow them to eat what was considered the best. They fundamentally disagreed with the policy because of their faith. Sound familiar? Listen, your faith will be in tension with government authority. There is no government in human history anywhere that completely aligns with your faith. It just doesn't happen. And we can argue that it does. We can walk through the conservative talking points and go, what about this and this and this and this and this? Keep looking, you're going to find something. And I honestly don't think it takes that long. Your faith is going to be in tension with government authority because the governments of man are not the same as the kingdom of God. And we cannot mistake the two. At some point, it's going to be in tension with governing authorities. More than that, your faith will be in tension with your political party if you associate with one. And here's what I struggle with. I struggle with Christians whose faith, the, the talking points of their faith match word for words the talking point of a political party. And my fear is that those believers who their faith points and their political points that are the exact same, that they're worshiping a false idol that's trying to get their vote. And I'm not saying that all policies and all political parties are bad. That would be absurd. But I am saying not every single one of them is going to align with Scripture. Never in human history has a government of man equaled the kingdom of God. Because think about it for a second. If it did, why would we need the kingdom of God? Why would we need Jesus to die on the cross and save us if a government or a political party could? And so when we face these moments of tension, our own version of, I can't eat that food, right? I mean, keep in mind, right? This is Daniel and these, these Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, these four guys, they have to eat something. They ha they, we have to have some opinions. We have to think towards some policy or stance on something. But the question is, what do we do when it contradicts? Well, let's keep looking. Let's see what these guys do. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. 
And the chief eunuch said to Daniel, I fear my Lord, the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who were of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. The eunuch's going, look, you got to eat this food, man. Like it's my job to tell you to eat it. Like I get it, right? I get it, but like, here's the thing, right? I'm already a eunuch. I don't want to lose my head too. Like that's dangerous. Daniel's decision involved standing firm when other Israelites did not. Because if you look at this passage again, right? It it says when other youths who are your own age, right? How can you be in worse condition than other youths of your own age? The eunuch is making a comparison and he's comparing them to other Jewish males, Out of all the Jewish males who, I mean, not all of them would offer these food, but obviously there are some others who are because he's making a comparison. What does that tell you? That there are people who are in the same boat as Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who are compromising and are eating the food that these four men think is, is against their faith conscience. And so in situations like this, Daniel and his friends become the outliers. Man, we don't like being outliers. We like fitting in with the crowd. We don't want people to like to come after us. We don't want to, we, we don't want to stick out. Anybody just love sticking out? Or are you like, yeah, I, I really want to go with the flow. Yeah, I know you like sticking out. That's why you're raising your hand right now. When we disagree with someone, well, there is a tendency to do two things, either to argue or to compromise. Arguing may prove your point, but rarely does it lead to peace and resolution. What was the last time in a fist fight that somebody punched somebody and then somebody punched him back and then someone punched him back and you went, you know what? I think we've all had our say. No, you keep fighting until you can't anymore. When you're debating somebody, right? Don't we like start thinking of our own argument while they're talking? Sometimes we interrupt them. But like before they even finish talking, we already know how we're going to respond. I love debate. Like love debate. I think it's so much fun. I love to point out flaws in other people's arguments. I love proving my case so convincingly that any bystanders would have no other option but to agree with me, cheer, clap, raise me on their shoulders, and march me around the town square, right? That is like how much I love debating and being right. Part of the reason that I have always loved academics is I love the idea of a classroom and debating like topics in a classroom and using like good sources and citations and like going, well, so-and-so said this. Yeah, but this theologian said this. And like, it's so much fun. Don't you agree? Yes. I'm getting weird looks now. In high school, three times I qualified for state debate. But the more adamantly I argue a position, you know what I found out? The more adamantly the opposing side argues back. And I could sit here right now and tell you how you're wrong about something and I could prove this and this and this and this. And you could look at me and go, yeah, but still. And I'm going, what do you mean, yeah, but still? Rarely does arguing with one another ever convince someone. Take the presidential debates, for example. You know who wins that a presidential debate every year? It depends on what news station you watch. Arguing may prove your point, but rarely does it lead to peace and resolution. And so we know that the, that the option is not to argue, right? We can't, if we disagree with a person politically, right? We can't just argue with them. Well, then you have the, the, the other option, which is to compromise. And compromise is relinquishing a held belief or position in favor of less resistance, right? It's easier to go, okay, yeah, yeah, I get it. No, you're right. And here's me. Compromise is not always bad. Compromise sometimes is, is a way forward. Most laws in Congress don't get passed without some kind of compromise. 
Married couples could never find peace or a place to eat out without compromise. Peace treaties, professional negotiations, buying a car, which I may be doing soon, doesn't happen without compromise. But compromise is also, there's a second definition, right? And this is the second one we're using. Compromise is also letting something go that damages your integrity. It's letting something go, but then because of you letting it go, it damages your integrity. Let me give you a great example. Ships whose holes are compromised are not safe to be in the water. Anybody ever been on a sinking boat? My family at our, at our uh, farm in Alabama, we have this little metal, just kind of cheap rowboat that we sometimes fish out of, except there's a hole in the very bottom of it that we can't really figure out where that hole is or where the water comes in at. So here's what you do, right? You get in and you're good for a little bit and you go and you got about 20 minutes of fishing before you better hightail it back to the shore or so you're going to be swimming back. And then you dump the water and you can put the boat back in and go and fish some more. The whole of that boat is compromised. It is not safe to be on the water for more than 20 minutes and still even that 20 minutes sometimes is pushing it. When data storage is compromised, it's because there's a weakness and a risk of cyber theft. I'm sure we've all gotten those emails or text messages, hey, our systems were compromised, which means they took your name and your social security number and your mother's maiden name, and you're, you, you should probably talk to somebody or have cybersecurity insurance, which is a thing. Spouses who cheat compromise their marriage covenant. And when we compromise in our faith, sometimes it's to agree with a position or policy. And when we do that, we damage our witness. We damage our ability to tell other people about you. And we can have a tendency to argue with others. This is interesting, right? We, we do. We have a tendency to argue with others who have different political views. But here's the scary thing is I think that we have a tendency to compromise with others who have similar political views. For an opposing party, we go, no, let's argue with them. But if it's our own, I think the tendency is more to go, yeah, okay, no, yeah. They, they say that, I guess I believe that too. And in doing so, we do. We damage our witness and compromise our faith to agree with a position or a policy. And here we go. We tend to argue with people who have different political views and compromise with people who have the same. This doesn't seem like good options, does it? There's a third option. Do you want to hear it? Because it's kind of sad right now. <laughs> because Daniel chose a third option. He set an example. Let's look at what he did. Verse 11. Then Daniel said to the steward, he's not arguing, right? He said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. There you go. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Test your servants for 10 days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants according to what you see. Daniel depended on God and he chose to set the example instead of arguing or compromising. He didn't debate. He didn't give in and eat the king's food. He chose what was behind door number three. Verse 14, so he listened to them in this matter, the, the chief eunuch, and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were, in better, they were better in appearance, fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. Which any of you people in here who like barbecue are like, God, let's pray for them. <laughs> what? All they had was vegetables. I have a buddy who, for some reason, had a diet where 
he could only eat he couldn't eat red meat or 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 like like proteins like heavy proteins like meat chicken pork fish uh he could eat eggs and vegetables and that man ate eggs three times a day because he did not want to eat vegetables but daniel liked vegetables at least he felt compelled in his because of his faith to eat vegetables if Daniel had have argued with the chief eunuch, if Shadrach had have posted on his TikTok that the king's food order was fake news, right? Do you think that the chief eunuch would have listened? By the way, I did an AI image search this week and I was like, Shadrach from the Bible posting to TikTok wearing a fire t-shirt. We'll talk about why he's wearing a fire t-shirt later. Um, and like AI generated all these like images. I was trying to have one to put up on the screen. None of them worked. They all were goofy <laughs> looking and like weird. Uh, but uh, wow, what, what, what cra crazy things technology is doing, right? Um, like, no, I mean, like if, if arguing was the choice, the chief eunuch would have either forced them to eat it or killed them or kicked them out of the palace. When we choose not to argue, we create opportunities to be heard. They've done science. Moms, this is going to help you out. They've done science that there is something genetically built into us that when our mothers, specifically mothers, start lecturing, or sometimes we would say nagging, and we're not supposed to say that word, but like, like, Something in our brains shuts off our listening mechanisms. So when our moms are arguing or lecturing us, regardless of the age, at some point, like, we'll stop listening. Anybody feel like they just stop listening to their mom when they start arguing with them? Anybody brave enough to raise your hands? Jesus knows and so does your mom. <laughs> like, it's, it's, it's physiologically part of who we are. Some of you, as, as moms, are like, is that why they have that glassed over look when I'm telling them what they're doing wrong? Yes, it literally is. Arguing does not create opportunities to be heard. But when we choose not to argue, we do create those opportunities. So, so I think what it does is it puts us in a place where we go, hey, is it more important for me to be right and to prove my point to myself and to argue so I know I'm right? Or is it more important to be heard? I'm actually in this conversation to, to have a positive conversation, or am I just looking to pick a fight so I can be right? Daniel didn't argue. He didn't compromise. Instead, he said, hey, let me show you. Test us. Let us, let us live this example. We'll make, like, like and, and, and if, if, if it works, it works. Great. If not, then we'll, we'll eat your food. But just test us. Verse 17 says, as for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. By the way, Babylon was educating them, but who gave them their wisdom? God. When we are faithful to God, he is faithful to us. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams, and we're going to talk about this in the coming weeks. At the end of the time when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, right? This is the end of the three years. The chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Go back a second. And in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king inquired of them, This is really interesting. I think this is really interesting. I can guarantee you something. 
about this story, 100%. I guarantee you that Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego never voted for Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> would never have chosen him to be their king. They would have never chosen Babylon to be their kingdom. But when the king went to them for truth and wisdom, they were in a position to offer truth. Not what the king wanted to hear. We've already known that they set the example. And we'll, we'll see later how they don't just compromise. All four of these guys get in some pretty difficult situations. They don't compromise their faith. They don't just argue, but they have positioned themselves to honor God first and foremost. And because they've honored God, they have an opportunity to influence a king that they would never vote for and a kingdom they would never choose to live in. You want to make a difference? Posting your views on social media? I'm going to go ahead and say never makes a difference. Rarely, if ever, makes a difference. I can maybe think of one argument I've read on social media that went, oh, wow, that's a really good point. Rarely does it make a difference. Setting the example, that makes the difference. That creates opportunities to be listened to. That creates opportunity for God to use the truth that is instilled in you to make an impact in people even that you disagree with. I don't know how many times I've heard stories of Christians and atheists and Christians who are just when they're kind to atheists, you know what it does? It opens their heart. One of our elders, Josh Gruning, he shared this story. This has happened to him. He has a former coworker, a friend, who does not believe in God. And he knows Josh does. And out of everyone who works with him, you know who's made the biggest difference? The one who holds on to truth. That lives the example that shows even the atheist Jesus. Being a faithful citizen of God's kingdom will elevate your position above quarrels and compromise. And if we can rise above that level of disagreement, of the filth that we're reading on the news or listening to from the news, and really rise above all of that and interact with the person what would it do if as followers of Jesus first, we had the opportunity to love them so that they could see the truth in who Jesus is? Not the truth about our party, but the truth about Jesus. Which leads me to the question, which would you rather? That your neighbors, that your friends, that your family members vote like you or go to heaven like you? Because we have the opportunity to show truth. And when faithfully following God matters more, this is really important, the positions we disagree with become far less urgent. It doesn't mean that you're going to agree. You can still disagree with them, but you can love them. You can still disagree with them, but you can let the example of your life dedicated to Christ make a difference in their life and still disagree with them. You can die disagreeing. But as long as you agree on Jesus, you're going to get to have more conversations. I don't know what the political debates are going to look like in heaven. I hope we get some debates because I really like debates. Maybe like I'll have that dream come true. People put me on their shoulders and cheer my name. I don't know. Probably not. Can I encourage you with something? God is in control. Nothing happens that we read about in the news or watch on the news that God is surprised about. Last night, Iran sent 300 missiles and drones into Jerusalem and other parts of Israel. That didn't surprise God. Did you know that? That, was not a, that? that may have been a surprise to some people. It was not a surprise to God. He's not surprised by anything that happens in our culture. He's never caught off guard. 
But you know what his first request of you is? Knowing everything that's going to happen. It's not to go fight to make it right. It's follow me. He asks us to follow him. I stand at the door and knock. Living an example consistent with faith created opportunities for Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to influence the highest levels of the Babylonian government. And the best way that I believe that we can make a difference in a politically divided world is to follow Jesus and live according to what he taught and then to love people. That's it. Like that's the policy. That's the position. That's what should get your vote. Because if we can do this, we'll make a difference. If we can live this, we'll start finding more things to agree about than to disagree about. If we can live this, we're going to not just see people's opinions change, we're going to see their eternities changed. And we can invite other people to be citizens of heaven too. But sometimes it's going to mean we're going to have to sacrifice the argument. And sometimes we're going to have to choose not to compromise. And we live the example. We live out what Jesus taught. Well, how do I know what he taught? Read the first four books of the New Testament. When you finish them, read them again. When you finish them again, read them again. Start them again the next day. You want to know how Jesus taught us to live? Read what Jesus said. And just see the difference that it'll make in you and in other people. So here's my challenge. Sometime over the next year, I would guarantee you every single one of us is going to face someone that we disagree with because culture tells us that we're supposed to disagree with them. Because our political views tell us we're supposed to disagree with them. We're going to have the opportunity to argue. We're going to have the opportunity sometimes to compromise. My challenge is that you set the example, that you love people. You choose not to argue. And you live a life that follows Jesus and that you allow that to make your difference. And if we can do that, the kingdom of God is going to get a whole lot bigger. And we're going to be able to make a bigger difference than any policy or position ever would. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. That you are worthy of our love. You're worthy of our worship. That your kingdom has no rival for any, from any kingdom on earth, that your goodness, your love, your righteousness that we get to walk into, the pursuit of holiness and living in light of who you are is far more better than pursuing anything man has ever made. I pray that you give us the courage to be good citizens of heaven and let that influence how we are citizens here on earth. And let us set the example. When the opportunities come to argue or to compromise, let us ask, what is the example? And let us love other people in those conversations and through those conversations. We thank you and we love you. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.